funny. I mean, a lot of expressions go on by the wayside. Like, for example, you know, when's the last time anyone has really dialed a phone? You know, you push buttons on the phone, you know. Uh, and, I was three. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a dial tone. Yeah, a dial tone, right, right. Um, how you'd be annoyed if, if people had high numbers because it took longer to dial a nine than it did a, a, a one. Especially when you misdial. Miss, especially when you misdial because your finger would slip again. off right, exactly. Or even or even worse. Now, I, I when we had this, I was too young to like know anyone to talk on the phone with. But we had a party line. Whereas, like, you might pick up the phone, it might be your neighbor talking, you know, because there was, like, only so many wires that went, you know. My grandparents so, had a party. Line. Yeah. I'm also pretty sure that at one point you only needed to dial four numbers, like, to get our phone. Like, if you lived in the same area, Lorraine, you didn't have to dial the whole thing, just the number, the last four numbers, and you get an almost like extension. All right. So enough reminiscing today. We're, we have two aims today. Um... We are going to uh, talk a little bit about typography in CSS, and we are going to uh, start our intro to animation. Uh, so we hope to get both of those, and I hope to talk a little bit about um, your first uh, animation assignment, which is more of a uh, investigative thing to talk about finding effective and ineffective uses of animation. At any rate. Um, as we get into the last part of the semester and working on the project, anything that we don't cover via uh, regarding CSS and HTML, we can discuss on an individual basis. My aim is to sort of give you a template that you can use. So if you haven't done any HTML, you know, you can at least like use this template to sort of do your project and maybe just fill in a few details. Whereas if you have done some HTML, you can either take the template or experiment on your own or, or whatever. Uh, I do encourage you all to, to try and to practice some of these HTML and to get, um, get more familiar with it. Particularly, and I know I think two of you have had my CISS 216 class, the web development class, but probably when you took it, we did not cover HTML5. So. Same simpler. Pardon me? Seems a little simpler. It is, I don't know if I'd say it's simpler. It is, it, it's looking at, that they've created tags for what web pages have become, as opposed to having very generic tags that very specific purpose tags. Like, for example, the, one of the main things is with all the structural uh, tags, like article and nav and banner and all that. You know, in the old days, in, in HTML4 and previous, all of those were accomplished by divs. And thing about divs are, divs were confusing for some students because they're just generic. What are they? They're a container. They're a way to group some tags together. Whereas now, there's special purpose tags for each of those se uh, sections. So in that regard, they kind of fine-tune that a, a little bit more. All right, let's go and bring up the example we had last time and then play with the typography of this. Yeah, that's legitimately a panic point. Like, for example, if I notice smoke coming from the ceiling, I would just need to click that and security would be dispatched here. Yeah. And My computer means shut up and pour the wife's here. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not the case on this computer. <laughs> uh, the... Um, I guess security does come too, because I guess if some people have like accidentally clicked on it, they meant to like click on one icon, they really weren't paying attention and clicked on that, and I guess security will come. It is funny, I was in a doctor's office when they must have like accidentally hit like a speed dial for 911, you know. So there was a cop there, and he was like, you know, what's going on? And they're like, oh, nothing. And like, well, someone from here dial 911. They're like, that eh, must have been an accident. You know, yeah. and and the cop was like, "Well, let me just have a look around, like just in case we were like the kidnappers telling them, no, no, it was an accident." You know, and you go back there, everyone's like locked in a room in the back or something. But yeah, it was kind of funny. Like he, like, but I, I mean, I guess that makes sense if you're in that position. We were all scared. Like 
What's going on? What's going on? No, I intend on doing that shortly, possibly even later today. I do apologize. The 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 pr the problem with that one is um, what, what I yeah well less than that then when I thought to go and grade it I wasn't able to listen to the audio and and like so a couple times I've gone to grade and it's like oh you know I'm in a lab I can't really listen I don't have any headphones with me so I do apologize but I should be getting to those lately or uh, uh, quickly all right. So I went and I made three files last time, three HTML files. I'll move that away from the panic button. Now you have me worried. And I made an external CSS file as well. The idea here is that we can be so flexible with our page if we keep the HTML and the CSS separate. So what we have here in our web page is we have a link to that CSS file. So we tell our web page, hey, use that CSS file. That way we can put all the things about colors and all that in this file and we don't have to worry about, um, you know, uh, if we change it in one place it, it gets changed on all our pages. I would suggest, especially for this assignment or for this project, that you make sure you get your HTML down first and then just clone it for each of the pages because you're going to have certain sections of the page that are going to be in common, like probably the banner and the or the header and the navigation and so on, and maybe even a footer. This part, this section in the middle here, is the one that's going to be apt to be different. All right? So therefore, um, you know, once you get the other stuff on the page down, you can then go and clone it and only fill in this one section. So in that way, making a 10-page website doesn't take 10 times as long as making a one-page website, right? Because you spend a fair amount of time getting the one page the way you want it, then you just clone it and change the parts that are different, all right? Okay. Yeah, these are already posted. These are in the lectures folder, and then what I expand on it today will be posted there as well. We started last time in on the CSS, and we, we covered the most simple things, and that is we can, we can set the colors of things. So I'm really going to talk about, um, I'm really focused uh, for this class to talk about the CSS that relates to typography. And what are the key elements of typography? There's font, there's font size, there's color, and there's white space. That is the spacing uh, between. So that's really what my focus is going to be on. You can do a lot of other things. And again, if you look at the W3C schools, uh, W3 schools, you can see uh, a lot of the resources about that. Where we left off last time is we had our page with our CSS file. And I made a couple of changes here. That don't work. All right. At least they don't work in Internet Explorer. They do work in Firefox, however. Um, there's actually code that you can put in. The problem is, is that the version of Internet Explorer that we're running doesn't support HTML5. So therefore, it gets confused with those things. Now, again, if we were in a full-blown web development class, um, my suggestion to you would be to, there, there's code that we can insert in there. But in the interest of time, if anyone is really interested in it, I can review it with them. You actually can just Google HTML5 shiv, S-I-H-I-V, and it will, it, will, it will give you some code. There's also a, a fix for earlier versions of Firefox, but apparently in this case our version of Firefox is fine, and, and it's showing the proper uh, HTML5 code. 
That's always an issue, and that's always a challenge with this. Um, that was my suggestion that you run either like the newest version. Uh, make sure your pages look good on, on, say, the newest version of any of the big browsers, and you should be fine. Because again, we're not we're not going to focus on um, browser compatibility because that's not really the main event here. So we'll look at this page in Firefox and from now on. So two of the things we can play with: we can ch play with the background, and we can change. I'll play with the color. For these examples, I'm doing like the most simple thing, all right, the most simple way of doing it. Know that there is, with CSS, there is about a half dozen ways you can do almost anything, you know, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a simple approach. All right, so that's one thing that you can do. And again, you want to make sure that the, the contrast between the, the text and the background is adequate. So I'm doing this to demonstrate, yeah, I think that's probably readable enough. You know, but you do want to pay attention to the contrast between the foreground and the background. All right. Next thing I want to look at is the font. All right. And the specific font face. And we talked about typography and we talked about all these things. Uh, in CSS, the kind of fonts that you have, um, or the kind of fonts that you specify, let me rephrase this, you typically specify not a single font, but a list of fonts. Why do you specify a list of fonts? Because on any given client, you don't know what they have installed. For example, let's say that you were all hyped about the movie Helvetica, and you wanted to put, make, make your web page in Helvetica. Well, most Windows machines, believe it or not, don't have Helvetica installed. All right? Macs have Helvetica installed. Windows machines typically don't. So if I said, Something like this. Well, let me make sure this one doesn't have Helvetica installed, just to be accurate. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have like a, a seven-year-old MacBook that has like less than a gig of free disk space, and it runs like a screamer compared to this one. I don't know. I don't know what, what the deal is with this machine. Why it doesn't seem to behave itself. Let's look, and I'll, I'll look just by looking at the list of fonts in Word. Does this guy have Helvetica? And I'll bet it won't. So if I look here in my list of fonts, I go down here, I do, I do not see any Helvetica. So if I were to go in my style sheet and say font family colon Helvetica, all right, if I save this, and look at my web page. I lied. It does have Helvetica. All right. I didn't see it in Word. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it's available elsewhere. Trust me, though. There will be machines that don't have a certain font installed. So typically, you give a list of fonts. So. What does it do if it doesn't? It runs down. It, it runs down the list till it hits the default. So, for example, so is that a default we're looking at, not the right Helvetica? It's possible. Oftentimes, you'll see font declarations look like this: font family colon font one comma font font two comma generic font. And what happens is the browser will run down the list until it finds a font that it has. Or it hits a generic font, which all browsers will have. So, for example, Helvetica is a sans serif font. So, the assumption here is for whatever reason, I probably want my page being a sans serif font. So, all of these are sans serif fonts. Helvetica is, Arial is sort of Microsoft's version of Helvetica. And then the very last one, sans serif, means Use the browser's generic sans serif font if it has one. And all browsers have a generic sans serif font. 
All right. So let me do this. Let me just make a garbage name for a font. It's not going to have this font. So now if I look at it, I get the browser's default, which is Times New Roman. Now, I could go and I could separate by commas and then say Arial. So it's not going to have that first font because that's a gar garbage name. This browser will have Arial, so it will display it using the font Arial. Sure enough. Now, what if the second font is a garbage name? Well, again, doesn't have it, it will use the browser's default font. I can specify at the very end of this just either serif or sans serif, and it will use the browser's generic serif or sans serif font. which is that. All right. In other words, typically, when you do this, you'll have at least three fonts, and the last font will either be serif or sans serif, which represents the browser's generic um, serif or sans serif font. Usually, the way it looks is, you know, you'll have a font for Mac slash Linux, you'll have a font for Windows, and then you'll have a generic kind of all bets are off one. Um, if we do a Google here, we'll see sort of the popular combinations and what you can count on, um, where you can pretty well be assured Safe fonts simply means that these are the fonts that you can reasonably assure someone's going to have. They're safe to use on the web. So they show some example here with serif fonts, Georgia comma serif, Palatino linotype, Book Antiqua, and so on, and so on down the line. So these are combinations that typically go together. That's the one that I demonstrated, although I had them in reverse order. All right. Then, of course, if you remember, we talked about when we, when we went over these examples that um, a lot of times our text will be one font and our headings will be another. You know, it's almost like colors, right? You, you know, you want to possibly use a few colors. You don't want to use dozens of colors. Same sort of thing with fonts. The fonts sort of give a signal to people that there's something different about it. And therefore, you might want to use a couple of them uh, and not a lot of them. And what's typically done is that serif fonts are used for things such as headlines and headers and all that. Whereas sans serif fonts are used for um, smaller text. So I could go something like this. And again, my heading is done in a serif font and the other stuff is done in sans serif. Why is it that? Well, again, we have our selector and we have our style rule. The selector says what on the page gets that style rule. This well, is a style rule. Do you do that in the CSS? Or yes. Yeah. Um, um, 
that actually has a long answer. Let's look at the way to do it in CSS. What you can do actually, well, we'll give you this, we'll give you the, the mini version of the long answer. To strongly emphasize something, which by default means bold, you use a strong tag around it. I've seen that not work. Um, well, that you had to use a B instead of strong. Um, yeah, what, what you can do via CSS is you can you can specify that strongs are implemented by bold. So, oops. all right, there. Notice that word is bold and that word is italics. But keep in mind that we may want to implement something that's emphasized a couple different ways. We might, in addition to making it bold, we might want to make it bigger. So what we could do is we could put a CSS rule in here that says, oops, strong, uh, strong, I want the font size to be 1.2M. Now what is M? M is short for emphasis. So 1.2 emphasis means it is 1.2 times the normal size. So if I did 2M, that would be like 2 times the normal size. So now, in addition to being bold, it's a little bit bigger. We could find, if we look at um, the CSS, styling text, we can do things like text decoration, what is it? Text align, line height, letter spacing, word spacing. Styling fonts. Font style, we could say bold. So we could make our headings have a font style. of bold, I think. I stand corrected. Font weight bold. So that's some of the things we can do. There's also text decoration. We can look at this. Text decoration. Um, the two things that I would look at would be under styling fonts and styling text. I can actually do things like put more space between the lines by doing things like line height space between the paragraphs. So you really have tons of flexibility on this, and my suggestion would be to play around with this. The last thing I want to talk about before we move on is a little bit about doing white space between things, because remember, all these typographical elements we do to help bring focus to certain parts of our page, and we don't want things to sort of get like lost in the shuffle. All right? We want things to stand out. 
And there's a lot of ways we can make things stand out. We can make them stand out by, by having different colors, by different fonts. But one way we can do it is by having white space between it. So one thing we could do is we could do something like giving these guys margins. So for example, I could say margin do something big so we notice it. 100 pixels. And then if we look at it, notice what that will do is that will put an extra 100 pixels all four directions around that section. So around the top, side, bottom, and... Why did it apply just to that section? Well, because the selector. The selector was section. So... The only thing I have in this web page that's a section oops, is this guy. So if I wanted to do for the footer, I could specify that. Um, so by the use of the margin, and another thing you can do is a width, and all these things, you can sort of get it like a nice, sort of more centered look. Uh, multiple uh, places uh, that you would call section? Would they be numbered? Or well. Is, is section a generic term for the body, the body type? Um, the section is something that's in the body. Okay, so it's not the name of that. A section is, is a name for a chunk of content. And you can have more than one section. All right. And in this case, because I've specified two sections, this style rule applies to each section. All right. So every section will get this style rule. So if I look at this, then both of those have the same margin. If you don't want that to happen, there's things that we can do to keep that from happening. But again, we can, we can cover those individually. Because sometimes you might not literally want every section to look the same. But I think you can see with a little bit of playing around with the margins and padding, uh, padding is a little bit different way of spacing all this, you can, without tons of effort, make a fairly attractive looking web page. At least a serviceable web page. And that's really all I'm asking uh, for you to do um, for the assignment, is to make uh, a serviceable web page a place for you to house your content. All right? So I will copy the, this example up uh, to uh, the web, and you're welcome to use this and to alter it and extend it and go beyond it um, as you go into your project. And again, we'll, we, we can spend time discussing some of these things uh, individually. All right? Okay, on the animation, what I want to start out doing is talking about what your first animation assignment is. I actually did not get as far planning this course as I thought I would. I had a really bad headache that put me out of commission for most of the day yesterday. So I really did not plan everything, but I did start to plan this section. And I have a couple of comments here, or a couple of things in the reading section and the concepts, but I will be adding more. One discussion question that we, we may have time to, to think about this. If we don't have time to talk about this in class, you can post your thoughts online. But what sort of things would animation, for what sort of things would animation then video or other multimedia elements? Believe it or not, I wrote that when I did not have a headache, even though it sounds like I did. For what sort of things would animation be better than video or other multimedia elements? Your first assignment is simply to create a journal entry. that contains a site that makes use of animation in enhancing the site's message content usability. In other words, not purely for entertainment. Okay? Um, there's all kinds of wonderful 
cool, fun anime.